I'm Catherine McLean, founder and CEO of Dylan Green, and today I have with me Tasha McCarter. Tasha is the VP of Clean Tech Strategic Growth at RWE. Thanks for joining us, Tasha. Thank you. I'm happy to be here, Catherine. And Tasha is joining us from Austin, Texas, one of uh, my favorite cities. So uh, a little, a little jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I love it there. Uh, so, can you introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about your current role at RWE? For sure. Um, of course, as you said, Tasha McCarter, I am the VP of Clean Tech Strategic Growth here at RWE. Uh, it is a new role for me, um, a new role for the company, as a matter of fact. Previously, I was the VP of Project Engineering, where I led the technology ag agnostic execution of wind, battery storage, and green hydrogen once we bring more line facilities um, right. and solar, of, of course. Um, but now in this new role, um, which I started on January 15th, my focus is on non-project delivery tasks that support our ability to grow and sustain our growth. And mm -hmm. really what that means is, you know, organizations have to be amb ambidextrous, right? You have right. to focus on delivery, but then you also have to focus on that engine that, uh, that creates continuous growth. So I'm looking at, you know, technologies of the future and what is relevant to RWE as we continue to grow and uh, scale. I'm looking at our team, uh, working with our team to upskill our team and position them for our growth trajectory. And then also focused on some other aspects of integrating our teams. So mm -hmm. it's really a people process technology focus that I have right now. And you initially became interested in the energy sector from a science experiment in the third grade, I hear. Um, can you share that story and what sparked your initial interest in energy? Yeah, you know, I, and I love this story. Um, third grade was such a long time ago for me. And I would really <laughs> like to give that teacher a hug if I could. Um, <laughs> but, you know, when I was in third grade, um, you know, our science teacher was very hands on. Um, yeah. We had, you know, different projects that we would do. And one project that we did was we hooked a, some wires up to a hand crank generator. If you think the old school pencil sharpener, that's the mm -hmm. hand crank generator. We hooked some wires up between that and the light bulb. And when we cranked the generator, the light bulb came on. Yeah. And, you know, I was just so fascinated with that. I was just, you know, just like, wow, light is produced from something that's so simple. Right. And at that point, you know, I knew uh, or, or I said, I want to do that for a living, whatever it right. is. And I was told at some point, you know, in my youth that that was engineering and that I should become an engineer. So yeah. um, hearing that, knowing how it made me feel to be able to produce electricity, yes. I just continued that throughout my high school and then college career. I really love that. I love that story. Uh, you majored in ele electrical engineering, uh, no surprise from that story, <laughs> um, and also went on to receive your MBA. Uh, can you talk a bit about how global conflict and energy security ultimately motivated you to focus on uh, renewable energy? Yeah, yeah. So um, when I finished undergrad, I started working in the architectural engineering space. Um, mm -hmm. And being from Detroit originally, a lot of our work was with the automotives and some healthcare facilities. Mm -hmm. So I spent the early part of my career uh, uh, designing power distribution systems for automotive facilities. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went on and got my MBA, and then I did a few things in the commercial space. And right. about 17 years ago, uh, which is quite some time ago now when I think about it, um, my husband took a job transfer from uh, Michigan to Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I had an opportunity to kind of step back and, you know, recalibrate and think about what I really enjoyed doing and where I could add most value. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, you know, renewables were in relatively nascent stage. That, this was like 20, 2008 or so. Right, right. Um, you know, it, the, the industry was in its nascent stage. Um, I looked at it. I studied it. I did um, a, a SWOT analysis on myself <laughs> um, and thought about, you know, if I go back into engineering, which is what I was looking at, I said, I want to go back to the space that I was passionate about. And around the same time in that 2008 time frame is when we were entrenched in a war in Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it was my uh, contemporaries that were actually physically over there fighting. 
Uh, we lost a few friends um, as a result of physically being boots on the ground. And I told myself, if I move back into engineering again, I want to do something that I'm passionate about. And I felt that renewables at that time was a way for us to be able to diversify our energy mix. Right. And it was my way in my contribution of taking a pair of boots off the ground in Iraq, because I, I truly felt that that was about oil over there. And yeah. I felt we needed to, re we needed to uh, diminish our, our reliance on oil. And this would be my contribution to that. Boy, that is just a, so incredible. So powerful. Did you say your husband was in the military? My husband is not in the military. He was working with an IT company. Um, okay. and, and yeah. And, and, and at the you time, a lot of people. you know, it was, yeah, yeah. Well, he, and he had friends from, you know, yeah. undergrad, right. That had gone yeah. into, you know, yeah. the military. From your roles at SunPower to Silicon Ranch to RWE, You've provided engineering support to virtually every stage in the life cycle of building a power plant. What are some of the projects that you're most proud of having worked on in your career? Most proud of work, working on, um, you know, working with uh, Sun Power was my entree into the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, we were at that point uh, coming down the cost curve, focused mm -hmm. on projects that were very large scale to facilitate coming down the cost curve. And then mm -hmm. also, the, you know, ferret out some of the challenges that may exist on plants of smaller scale. And so um, I ended up being at SunPower. When I started, I was a utility scale uh, design engineer. I became the lead engineer on uh, Antelope Valley or Solar Star um, was what the name of the plant. And it was a 579 megawatt uh, wow. AC solar plant. And so mm -hmm. this was the biggest, you know, design that I was responsible for. Um, it was one of the, the most challenging, obviously, mm -hmm. because, again, we were learning about the equipment as we were deploying it. Right. Um, and, you know, at that point, you know, there was a lot of activity when it came to uh, uh, municipalities and engagement there. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of things to, you know, uh, drive and manage and also uh, support the design. So that's the one that I'm you know most proud of because of the scale and scope. And uh, just when it was, and I think this was in 2014 timeframe. Mm -hmm. um, a few others that I'm definitely proud of. Uh, when I went to Silicon Ranch, you know, there were a number of, uh, of Georgia projects, one in particular, mm -hmm. Starkville. I was very involved with uh, delivering uh, as a manager, but more importantly, as a, uh, a partner with the utility. And so some right. of the, the ways and approaches that we engage with the utility made me um, proud to deliver that particular project. Do you, I mean, it's so interesting to me, too, because the projects that you're mentioning, like, they're really from coast to coast. You've worked so nationally, re really, not sort of one region, it looks like. That's true. Yeah. Um, according to the EIA, U.S. battery storage capacity has been growing since 2021 and could increase by 89% by the end of 2024 if developers bring all of the energy storage systems they have planned online by their intended commercial operation dates. California, no surprise, has the most installed battery storage capacity of any state uh, with 7.3 gigawatts, followed by Texas with 3.2 and Arizona with 800 megawatts. RWE has successfully completed projects in these regions as a robust storage pipeline. What challenges do you see when it comes to scaling energy storage deployments and how do you mitigate these challenges? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so let me start with the fact to say that the grid was not designed for renewables and right. definitely was not designed for battery storage projects in mind. Right. Uh, so this alone makes it challenging because you're faced with integrating a new technology into an existing mm -hmm. legacy system. Right. And by the nature of battery storage uh, being uh, uh, so diverse, and I would say that uh, diverse in the standpoint of energy storage can be a generator. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be a low when it's charging. Um, it can be part of the critical infrastructure. And so when you look at the roles that battery storage plays, um, they can play multiple roles uh, in mm -hmm. any given setting. And our policy framework was not written to uh, support one single technology operating in so many different ways. Right. So I would say that, you know, the regulatory and energy uh, frame of uh, the policy framework is say one of the biggest challenge because right now, as it stands, you know, when you go from region to region, ISO to ISO, you know, uh, NERC and FERC, you know, you have a different set of policies, you know, across all these different entities. 
Right. And so you really have to uh, get strategic in terms of how you pick your markets that you play in mm -hmm. based on the readiness of those particular markets, given some of those complexities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, RWE uh, as a uh, company is committed to finding, you know, that that path forward, uh, regardless of the market, uh, with the goal of scaling our uh, energy mix uh, or our delivery mix from 1% last year up to 25%. So we're wow. looking to the we're looking to deploy battery storage. It makes a lot of business sense, especially when you look at the Texas and uh, Arizona and, and California markets. Right. And so we're committed to doing what it takes to you know support policy, shape policy, um, and, and and drive technology such that you know the, it comes down the cost curve. So I would say just the legacy imp the legacy construction of our energy system presents the biggest challenge, but we are, we're committed to overcoming that challenge. Where do you see the most opportunity for growth outside of those three states? Just curious. You know, um, that's a great question. I think that, you know, we're starting to see some opportunities, say, in the Midwest, mm -hmm. um, in Illinois, um, as mm -hmm. an example. Um, I would say that that would be probably a, the next big market. Um, yeah. I'm not sure about you know, Georgia's uptake at this point, you know, I've spent some time in Georgia, of course, when I was with mm -hmm. Silicon Ranch, but I'm not sure about the uptake there. But mm -hmm. definitely in the Midwest, you know, as as the uh, uh, as the uh, interconnection partners, PJM, um, and as some of the companies there start to commit to, you know, right. the storage concept. So I want to talk a little bit now about diversity. I mean, you've had a very successful career in renewable energy and have unsurprisingly moved into managerial roles as your career has progressed. Have you found it challenging to recruit a diverse team? Like, what are some of the recommendations that you might have for managers looking to diversify their teams? Yeah. Um, you know, I would say that, uh, is it possible? Yes. Um, do you have to be intentional? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and so... You know, just basically when, when you think about diverse, I think about gender diversity, I think about ethnic, you know, diversity. Uh, and you think about when I, I'm part of our engineering organization, um, there's the, the population, the engineering population and community um, is not a huge community. So right. how do you find talent uh, in this community? So First of all, there are individuals out there, uh, and I'll just use an example. I mm -hmm. have a few folks that I've recruited, you know, over the last few years. Uh, they were actually brought to me by a recruiter who mm -hmm. was very deliberate in going out and sourcing talent. Now, did that individual uh, fit a uh, the exact say description at the time? At, no, and I was in the process <laughs> of building my team, and I'll give you, uh, I I'll say that. As I was building my team, I was able to be creative about how I shaped those roles, how right. a person could fit within those roles, right. deliver value, and then, you know, uh, so on and so forth, apply the same concept with additional hires. So I would say that you have to be creative and you have to be deliberate and you have to be intentional when you're sourcing mm -hmm. talent, um, understanding that, you know, they're just as bright as anyone. They might not have had the same set of experiences, but they're very capable of delivering against your goals. Yeah, I, I think that's great. That's great advice. Um, you've, uh, you've attributed some of your career success to fostering strong communities. Mm -hmm. um, you've also been a big proponent of mentorship. Um, can you share more about the role that organizations like RISE have played for you in your career? Um, I'd also like to hear more about your involvement with EDIC and Elemental Accelerator and ways in which you're giving back by supporting early stage career professionals. You obviously yeah. gave one example about hiring them, which is good. <laughs> um, so if you could talk a little bit more about other ways that you're helping as well. Yeah, um, you know, mentorship is definitely very important. Um, and, you know, uh, my interaction with RISE uh, came a little bit later in my career. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, RISE has probably been, it was, it was women of wind energy actually years ago. <laughs> and I became a, a, aware of the organization when I was, you know, moved here to Austin, I was looking away to get into the industry. Um, you know, at that time, you know, the focus is a little bit different, but as the organization pivoted to, to rise, I really started to engage. Um, and uh, Kristen was the, the executive director at the time, uh, having dialogue with her, 
uh, listening to some of the leadership forum content, participating and being mm -hmm. on panels when it came to the leadership forum. So it really, at this point in my career, was more of a give take where I would engage and support, mm -hmm. you know, the concept of men mentoring and sharing my you know, knowledge, but then at the same time, learning from some of the more senior keynote delivery types mm -hmm. of individuals. So mm -hmm. it was that back and forth. Um, Accelerator, uh, Accelerator in uh, my edict uh, interaction came through my experience with CELI. Mm -hmm. So a couple of years ago, I was part of the CELI cohort, and I believe mm -hmm. it was, you know, the pandemic, there were so many years that that seemed to blend, mm -hmm. blend together. But I believe was, uh, I was in the 2022 class of uh, CELI. Mm -hmm. And that's when I became, um, and, and, and that's Clean Energy Leadership yes. Institute, for those who don't yes. know. Mm -hmm. uh, but during that time, I became aware of the EDICT program. Um, and the EDICT program focus was primarily to uh, work with um, uh, uh, women and people of color to bring them into the industry. So targeting college age students, giving them an opportunity to learn more about the industry so that they mm -hmm. could be conversant when they went out there and started to explore the job market. Right. And so I was very attracted to that because um, this was a hands-on, high-touch way to equip this segment of the population with tools and knowledge to be able to come into the industry. And so uh, uh, Esther created the first uh, uh, edict uh, advisory board, and I sat on it. And we shaped some curriculum. I delivered some content. I mentored a few students. And so that was my involvement with EDICT at the time, which is in partnership with Accelerator. Mm -hmm. Accelerator. Accelerator. Excuse me. It's Element, a mouthful. Elemental Accelerator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a mouthful. Sorry about that. <laughs> what, you know, it's it, one of the things that it, is interesting, would be interesting to me is like, how did, how did you find getting into the industry? Because I, I feel like back, when you were getting into the industry, maybe it was a little bit easier because it was such a new industry. Everyone was getting in the industry because mm -hmm. I just feel like now there seems to be this like resistance to hire people who are not in the industry. And and I just I continue to find it baffling. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. how are we meant to fill all these jobs if we're not allowing anyone else to come in? I don't I don't. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it's interesting to your point, uh, everything is about supply and demand. Right. Right. Um, and so, you know, when I came into the industry uh, back in 2011, now granted I had worked for a number of years, both in the engineering and commercial space. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I was bringing stuff to the table though. Right. Not a lot of people had say industry experience right. specifically. So when I pitched my background to, you know, the uh, individual that hired me, I had the functional background that was a right fit. Right. And so, you know, it made sense. Now, as you uh, look at it now, what, 13 or so, 14 years later, you're right in terms of how the industry has grown. And now people, in theory, would have three to five years mm -hmm. experience. People are now focusing on that past experience, right. which is really not a predictor to success, to be honest. No. Um, and so, you know, we 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 have to be cognizant of the industry um, uh, uh, what what it takes to continue to sustain the growth of this industry, right? right. Yes, we want good talent, but we also want talent that um, have a, a a fit, right? In terms of, I committed, and this is not necessary, but this is my own story. When I've ridden a solar coaster, and the reason why I've stayed on a solar coaster is because I'm committed to eradicating climate change. I was committed to diminishing, you know, boots on the ground. You right. know, we, we have to, you know, look a little bit broader when we're sourcing talent, because it's sometimes it's those individuals that are committed to the end, you know, the, the concept of the industry, but, but may not necessarily have had industry experience that can be some of your best team members. Right. I totally agree. Uh, the next question is titled Calculated Genius. <laughs> which I'm super intrigued by. Um, you're also involved in an organization called Calculated Genius. Tell me about this and why you decided to support it. Yeah, um, Calculated Genius is headquartered in Chicago, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And the founder, um, uh, Kim, and I'm going to, I just I cannot place her last name right now. But Kim um, is an African-American um, woman who owns a uh, engineering design um, a firm. And uh, I think she probably has the largest engineering design firm in the nation. She's flown under the radar for years. 
Um, and she's really been growing her team. Her team does transmission and distribution design. And I connected with her initially. Um, right. And I, you know, connected with her as she was starting to get her nonprofit calculated genius off mm -hmm. the ground. Uh, when the time came um, and they were looking for board members, I'll put my name in the hat to become a board member because her approach to grooming talent, you know, is different than a lot of other uh, organizational approaches. Uh, right. Her approach is more high touch, as I mentioned, I value with uh, the EDIC program, high mm -hmm. touch, you know, high impact type of, mm -hmm. of engagement. So you won't necessarily find thousands of people that are part of the program. Right. Uh, what you will find is, you know, a few hundred people who mm -hmm. have really been groomed, really have been not only talked to about engineering, but talked about other aspects, more wraparound types of topics and aspects that mm -hmm. can then support them into getting into the industry and then yeah. sustaining in the industry. If you look at a certain segment of population, there might be some concerns that they may have versus the broader set, you know, a, a broader uh, population. And so really kind of understanding, you know, is it a ride to school that, you know, is a big problem for you? You know, that's just a very right. simple thing, but it can make right. a big difference for certain totally. folks. And so it's that type of wraparound, high touch, high impact service that they're providing to these uh, young women is what I'm attracted to. And that's where I tend to live my time. Uh, Kimberly Moore. More. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Sorry, Kim. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, okay, great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. And I really wish you the best of luck in your, uh, in your new role at RWE. Thank you.